Timothy chapter number 3. So we're going to be coming back later in the sermon to John chapter number 8. But for introductory purposes, I want to begin in 1 Timothy chapter number 3. The subject of the sermon this morning is the long-term effects of sin. The long-term effects of sin. So uh, periodically I've been preaching on uh, different subjects that are all somewhat related. You know, I've been talking about the snares of the devil. I talked about the subtlety of the devil or the subtlety, you know, of a false prophet. And I want to begin with a very similar subject right now before we actually get into the meat of the sermon and that is with the snares of the devil. The snares of the devil. So as I said, the subject is the long-term effects of sin. So look there in your Bibles at 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 7. The Bible says this, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. And then it says this, Lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Turn over to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. So that in context is actually speaking about a bishop. It's talking about the qualifications of a bishop and it gives a warning about a man and it's, it's uh, you know talking about him not being a novice. It's, it's going through all of these different uh, conditions that he has to fulfill in order to be qualified to be a pastor. And one of the things that it refers to it says lest he fall into reproach it says and the snare of the devil. So I want you to notice that the devil has snares. And what is a snare? What would we refer to uh, you know, a snare today more in our common vernacular? We would say a trap. That is what a snare is. A snare is a type of trap. You know, what you will do is you'll, you'll set up, you know, a trap or a snare and you'll use something that will lure, you know, whatever your, you know, prey is into that trap or into that snare. I want you to look with me at 2 Timothy chapter number 2 now. 2 Timothy chapter number 2 and notice that the snare of the devil is brought up again. So this is a common, you know, tactic of Satan is he will try to lure you into a, a trap. Obviously, you don't know it's a trap. The prey doesn't know it's a trap. They don't know that it's a snare. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 26. <clears throat> and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Now watch this. Who are taken captive by him at his will. Now when it says at his will, that's very interesting because that's referring to the devil's will. That's something that the devil wants. Now this isn't spoken of elsewhere in the Bible. It's talking about what the devil desires, what the devil wants. We actually are given insight on the devil's will here. And what is it? He wants to take people captive. He wants to take them captive. And what, is, what are you when you are you know, in captivity? You're a slave. Or you're a servant. Or you're, you know, uh, the Bible uses the word bond servant. You're in bondage. So right here it's talking about someone that is in bondage. And specifically, how did they get into bondage? How did they get into captivity? It was by a snare. So the way in which you are going to fall, you know, victim of, of becoming a servant or a slave or in bondage to the devil is by a snare. Now are you going to know it's a snare? Are you going to know it's a trap? Of course not, or you're not going to try to taste of it, or you're not going to try to you know, go in and, and attempt to try it, or what have you. So obviously you don't know it's a trap, you don't know it's a snare, but he sets it up and he tries to lure you in. He tries to bring you in. I want you to go to Proverbs chapter number 29. So in, in the introductory here, we're going to look at some verses pretty quickly. Proverbs chapter number uh, 29. Now what are these snares? What are these different traps? Well, they're sin. That's what these traps are. That's what these, these snares are. So what he does is he tries to lure you in with a particular sin. He knows your temptations as we spoke of on Sunday evening. He knows what you struggle with. He knows the, maybe the, your history. He knows your past and the things that you had, you know, uh, had problems with. And, and what he's going to try to do is he's, he's going to try to present that to you. He's going to try to present that to you. He's going to set it up in the snare and in a trap. And oftentimes this is the lie. And this ties in with the subject this morning of the long-term effects of sin. This is the lie. Is that you're ju you just need it this one time. Or you're just going to try it this one time. You know, it's just, it's just only going to be momentarily or temporarily. Right? That's what a trap is. That's what a snare is. They're just looking for that one meal. Now, that's the intent of the person that wants to take part of what's, being, what's luring them in. Whatever the object is that's drawing them in. They just want the food just for that one meal, don't they? If it, you speak, think of a rat, maybe you're setting out cheese. If you, maybe a raccoon, you have a larger trap, you put something to lure them in. What are they looking for? Are they looking for to be suffice for the rest of their life? No, they just want the one meal. 
They're just hungry and they want to be sufficed this one time, right? Just this one time. Well, sin for us works the exact same way. And when you're drawn into this trap, oftentimes what the lie is, is, hey, just try it one time. Just, you, you know, most people, when they get into sin initially and they know that it's wrong and they want to stay away from it, they're not setting themselves up for, you know, uh, to, to, to be in bondage, if you will, for the rest of their life, are they? What do they think they're doing? Just this one time. I just want to try it this once. And that's the lie from the devil. You know, and, and this will be, you know, fed from others to children, if you will, when they're, you know, uh, maybe being tempted as teenagers to do things. You know, just try it one time. It's never, hey, you know, you know you'll like to do this the rest of your life. That's never, it's always, every time, just try it one time. But the person that has the trap, what's their intent? Because there's two totally different objectives here. Their intent is, once you get into that trap, you're never getting out. That's the intent of the person that set the snare up. So once you notice, it's two totally different objectives. So when the devil sets his trap up, when the devil sets his snare up, he doesn't want you to just try it one time and then you enjoyed that, right? Now go back to you know, your life of Christianity, of loving the Lord and serving the Lord. That's not his goal. You know what he wants is he wants to take you captive. He wants, to, wants you to be like that raccoon. That he sees that meal in there. He steps inside of that cage, and you know what he wants to do? He wants to eat of that food, and you know what afterwards he's going to do? He's going to mosey on out, and he's going to go back to his home, to his nest, to his wilderness. He's going to be fine. But you know what happens is that gate closes, and now it's too late, and now you're stuck. You know what, what, what uh, state you're in? You're in captivity. You're in bondage. You're in servitude at this point. And that's exactly how sin works. Sin initially just draws you in. And the lie is, oh, it's just temporarily. You're just going to taste of it and you'll enjoy it and you can go back to your life. But that's not how sin works. There are always long-term effects of sin every single time. And that's what we're going to go over this morning is the long-term effects of sin. And as I said, transgression or sin is the snare. Look at Proverbs chapter number 29, verse number 6. It says this, In the transgression of an evil man, watch this, there is a snare. So I want you to notice that in the transgression, and what is a transgression? It's a sin. That's what it is. So notice that in that transgression or in that sin, do you know what's there? The snare. That's what is in there, the snare. I want you to go to, uh, uh, go back to John chapter number 8, if you will. John chapter number 8. John chapter number 8. Now 2 Peter chapter number 2 verse number 18 says this. It's speaking about how the devil operates uh, through his ministers particularly. It says this. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh. So I want you to notice that what the devil does is he allures through the lusts of the flesh. He tries to draw people in. He tries to allure them in. He tries to set up you know, something that's enticing to the eyes. He tries to first cause you to look at it and covet after it and lust after it. What's the point of all the flashing lights in Las Vegas? What is the point of that? Is that actually what people are taking part in? Is the, is, the, is the lights? Is that the reason why people go there? Of course not. They go there to gamble. They go there to drink. They go there, there to commit all manner of wickedness and sin. But the lights are meant to allure you in. The lights are meant to say, hey, look at all this fun. Look at, all this, look at the good time that you could have. It's meant to allure you in. What's the purpose of the bait that's set into the trap or the snare? It's meant to allure you in. Now, you know, those that are the, the you know, the, uh, those that operate or run Las Vegas, what do you think that they desire? Do you think they just want you to come and visit Las Vegas one time? Do you think that they just want you to come and visit their bar or visit their institution just the once? Of course not. They want you to come and they want you to just try to taste of it and then they want you to keep coming back repeatedly. So you're in John chapter number 8 where we had began. And I want you to notice that this is exactly what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about being a servant of sin. That snare is set out. That trap is set out. And initially, you just go in and you just want to try it the one time. You just want a taste of it. Right? You just want to just, just, just see what it's like. But that's not how sin works. And this is what we need to make especially our kids aware of. 
This is a perfect sermon for our children and kids and teenagers. We need to make them aware that it's not just the one time. Sin never works that way with any sin in any you know, area of life. Right. You always try it one time, but there are lingering effects throughout your entire life. And ultimately, where it leads is servitude and bondage and captivity. Why don't you look at John chapter number 8 with me. Look at John chapter number 8. Look at verse number 30. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now being a disciple of Christ is someone that's doing work. A person that is a disciple is someone that's doing work, right? They are doing the work of a person that they are following. What does it mean to be disciplined? A person that is disciplined is someone that actually does work. They do labor. So you can be saved and not necessarily be a disciple of Christ. You could be saved and not necessarily be following Jesus Christ in your lifestyle. As far as, you know, Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, right? And what is he referring to? Soul winning. So if you want to be a disciple of Christ, one of the ways is being a soul winner. One of the ways is preaching the gospel and getting people saved. So that's a perfect example of, you know, and there are many Christians that don't go soul winning. There are many Christians that don't get people saved, right? So that's a, one of, the, one of the, the things that Jesus Christ, uh, you know, can identify for us on how we can be a disciple. So you can, the point is this, you can be saved and not be a disciple. And he said in verse number 31, he said, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Verse 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So a saved person can still be in bondage with a particular sin, can't they? Because this is a person that just got saved. It says they believed on him right before this. But notice that if you continue in my word, then... Are you my disciples indeed? And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Watch verse 33. They answered him, now this is just the group of everyone. We be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? So they're saying, we're not in bondage. So do they know they're in bondage? They don't have a clue. They're in captivity. They're, they're, they're a servant and they're a slave, but they have no idea. And this is how it works with everyone that is in servitude to sin. I want you to keep reading. Look at what it says in verse number 34. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. So what is he saying that they're in bondage to? Or what are they in servitude to? They're, they're, they're a servant of what? They're a servant of sin. Now are they aware of it? They don't have a clue. They have no idea. They're saying we've never been in bondage to any man. But Jesus Christ said that they are a servant of of sin. I want you to go to Romans chapter number 6. Romans chapter number 6. Romans chapter number 6. At the moment of salvation, we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And we're saved. Right at that moment. We're sealed under the day of redemption. Right? Jesus tells us that if we believe on him, he says, we'll never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. But at the moment of salvation, we need to start purging out the sins in our life. We need to start sanctifying our life. We need to start walking in the Spirit as opposed to walking in the flesh. And Jesus is speaking here and tells you in that passage, John 8, to those that believed on Him first. And He's telling if you continue in My Word, then are you My disciples indeed. So that's what we need to do. We need to try to purge out the sins that are in our life. And He gives a little bit of a, a, you know, an insight on those that are living a sinful life. And He tells them that they are the servants of sin. And Anyone who is a servant to sin, anyone who is enslaved to a particular sin, who is addicted to a sin, if you try to talk to them about it, like, hey, you have a serious problem here, do you know what their response usually is? I have complete control. I have complete control over my life. You know, I, at any time, what do people say all the time that are addicted to cigarettes? What do people say all the time that are addicted to alcohol? I could quit at any time. Isn't that what they say all the time? So what are they trying to say? I'm not in servitude to, to alcohol. I'm not a servant to cigarettes. I'm not a servant to drugs or whatever it may be, to whatever you know, uh, sin in their life that they're struggling with. They tell you every single time, I could quit at any moment that I want. I could just quit at any time. Do they know that they're a servant to that sin? Do they know that, that 
you know, that they're enslaved to that sin, they don't have a clue. You know what they would say? We're not in bondage to any man. I'm not in bondage to any man. You know what Jesus says? That whosoever committed sin is a servant of sin. Right. Look at Romans chapter number 6. I get there myself. Romans chapter number 6. This is spoken of again. <clears throat> Romans 6 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That verse number 1 we can learn a lot from. I want you to notice that he posed a hypothetical question here. Uh, but there must first be one thing that's true before you can ask the question. It says this, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, those that believe you can lose your salvation, those that believe that you could, you know, after you're saved, you know, become unsaved, they wouldn't be able to explain this verse to you. Because the only way that the question could be asked, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, is that you could continue in sin and grace would abound. So even if you were to continue in sin, which you should not, obviously God would punish you while you're on this earth, you would not receive blessings from God, but would you still be saved if you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you continue in sin? Yes, grace would abound, but the question is, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And then he says, God forbid. So could we? Yes, we could, but we should not. We should not continue in sin. That grace, because grace will abound. And the reason why he asked the question is because he just said in the passage, in, in the chapter prior, uh, Romans 5.20, Moreover the law entered that the offense might abound. Now watch this. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So if you were to sin more, guess what? Grace abounds more. Grace would continue to abound. Amen. But should you? No. You know why? Because you're a servant to sin. And we need to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You continue in that sin, you, you're a servant to sin. You know, we want to be free. We don't want to be in captivity. But continue reading. It's kind of a side point. Look at verse 2. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this that our old man is crucified with him, saying he's dead, our old man is dead, the flesh, the life that we used to live, the sins that we struggled with, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Now watch this, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Of course, God doesn't want us any longer to serve sin. Verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now of course we have our soul that is saved today. Right? But we also still have this old man that is here with us. The old man that is, that is here still struggles with the temptations, still struggles in the flesh. He still has the same temptations that he had before. He still has those same struggles that he, that he had in the past. Look at verse 7. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon, or consider, ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Talking about that we should walk in the Spirit, and not after the lust of the flesh, not after the old man. Now look at verse 12. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body. Now, I want to I ask you a question. What does it mean to reign? R-E-I-G-N. Not reign as in, you know, uh, water outside, you know, coming from the sky. What does it mean? It means to rule. Now, when someone is reigning or ruling over you, what would you call that person? Obviously, a king. Or what would be another word that you could refer to them as? Your master. Exactly. Your master. And what would you be to that person? You would be their servant or you would be their slave. So who would be ruling over you? This is speaking to Christians. That's the point of John 8 and Romans 6 right now. This is speaking to Christians. What are you being advised of, Christian? You're being warned not to allow sin to reign over you. Not to allow sin to reign over you. Verse 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have 
dominion, just like reigning, over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? This is the same question, basically, that's posed in Romans 6.1. God forbid, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. And then it says in verse number 18, Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. Now notice this. So yes, in our soul, of course, as far as our status and our salvation, we are the servants of Christ. But we still have this old flesh. We still have this old man and we could yield those instruments unto sin and to obey the lust thereof. He says, I speak, I, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. So notice how a Christian still today, if they were to choose to live after the flesh, they could still be a servant of sin. They still could live after the flesh and be in servitude to sin. Now as I mentioned, there are these different snares. There are these different snares that the devil will set up for people. There are these traps that the devil will set up. And what he'll do is he'll take, as I said, you know, this ties in with Sunday evening sermon. He'll take whatever you struggle with yourself, whatever you have problems with, maybe in your past, your past life, in your flesh. And he'll take something customized or tailored for you and he'll put that in that trap. And he'll put that in that snare. And this works the same way with a person maybe that's just a young teenager, maybe somebody that's not even saved. He knows what they struggle with. You know what he wants to do is he wants to bring them into captivity. He wants to bring them into bondage. And he'll take whatever that is that he knows that he can lure you in and he'll put it into that, that snare. He'll put it into that trap. And to the person that's going, you know, uh, approaching, that's the prey, approaching the snare, approaching the trap, they're not aware that the decision that they're about to make is going to bring forth uh, long-term effects. It's going to bring forth consequences and, and effects that are going to be there and going to linger for the rest of their life. What they're interested in is just trying it one time. Now, if you look at the most basic example of people that are servants of sin, and I mentioned a few of these are just things that we would think of commonly when we think of addiction, right? And that would be like substance abuse on any level. You know, we can think of cigarettes, whatever it may be. And it all starts with someone saying what? Every single time, I don't care who you ask, a person that smoked a cigarette for the very first time, what does the person that offer it to them say? Exactly what I'd already mentioned. Just try it one time. And do you know what they think that they're about to do? Do you think that they're aware that I'm getting ready to start a habit that is going to continue on in, in my life to the point where I'm 50 and 60 years old and 70 years old? Of course not. They just want to be cool. They just want to have this temporary moment where they just, you know, just taste of the cigarette. Just one time, I'm just going to try the cigarette one time. That's what they think that they're going to do. That's how it's offered to them. But you know what ends up happening is they taste of that cigarette one time. Then they see somebody smoking the cigarette again. You know what it does? Is it draws them back in again. They go back and they try it again. They smoke it again. Then they, you know what they do is they go out and they... They buy a pack of cigarettes. Then they're smoking a pack of cigarettes, maybe a week. Then they're po smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. And if you ever have been around someone that has smoked cigarettes or that does smoke cigarettes, or maybe if you have, have, have uh, you know, struggled with this in the past, you know that the way that it works is you don't decide when you smoke that cigarette. You're not standing there and thinking, hey, I, you know, uh, I'm going to uh, you know, set a clock and this is when I'm going to take my, you know, my breaks, that, unless you work and you only have certain opportunities. But the person that smokes cigarettes, do you know when they want to smoke a cigarette? Is when they start getting that urge for a cigarette. When the cigarette starts you know, pulling at them and drawing them in. They don't just you know, choose, hey, I'm just going you know, to become you know, uh, 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 an addict where I'm just smoking cigarettes all the time in my life. You know, that's what I want to do, right when they took a, their first puff of a cigarette. Right. They become enslaved to the cigarette. The cigarette tells them when they're going to smoke. Right. 
That urge and that temptation pulls them in and draws them in and says, hey, you need a cigarette right now. You know how they start getting, they're not making the decisions. They start getting antsy. They start getting stressed. Do you know why? Because the cigarette's saying, hey, you need, you, need to, you need to come smoke. They're pulling them in. Same way with alcohol. I want you to turn in your Bibles, go to Proverbs chapter number 23. The same thing, the same thing works with alcohol. The same thing works with people that drink alcohol. You know what they do is they, you know, they'll, they'll get an opportunity, you know, uh, a teenager, maybe even an adult, right? They've never drank and they're, they're presented an opportunity, hey, you know, you should try this. You know, you should come out one time with us. You know what they do is they, they try it one time. You know what it does is it draws them in. It pulls them in. And then before you know it, they're addicted to it. They have a full-blown addiction and they become... There's, a, there's a, a common quote or a phrase where people say that they're, they're a slave to the bottle, right? They're a slave to the bottle. They don't decide, hey, you know, this is how I want to live my life. I'm just going to drink alcohol every single weekend. No, the addiction tells them when they're going to drink. The addiction tells them when they're going to be, you know, uh, consuming alcohol. They don't decide that. You know, my uncle, as an example, I had an uncle... You know, he ended up getting saved very late in life, but praise God, at least he's in heaven. But I had a, an uncle who was one of, my, one of my favorite uncles. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, he was just a great guy. He was very caring and stuff. But he started off, you know, m my family is, uh, you know, they're Baptist. My dad's actually a pastor. And uh, so they, you know, drinking and, and, and living a life of drugs and stuff like that is not common as far as my dad's brothers and sisters. But my, my father's brother, his name is Joe, he ended up becoming, a, you know, just a full-blown alcoholic at about the age of 30. And my dad said, I remember the very first time that Joe drank. I remember the very first time he was on his wedding, or he was on his uh, honeymoon, I'm sorry, right after his wedding. And he was in a hotel and he, for whatever reason, he was like 25, 26 years old, decided to go down to the bar that they had at the hotel and he drank alcohol. You know, he drank alcohol for the first time and he called my dad. My dad is, you know, my dad has taken one drink of beer and he said it tasted terrible and that's the only thing he's ever drank in his life. But he called my dad on the phone and was, and was telling him about it like, hey, you know, I just drank for the first time. They're very close in age. My dad had nine brothers and sisters, but Joe and him were two years apart. So they were very close friends. So he called my dad and was telling my dad about it. And at that time, my, my father was not serving God. He was not in church and things like that. And uh, so he, didn't, he was like, oh, you know, that's cool. You know, just kind of blew it off. Joe came back from his honeymoon. I can't remember where they had traveled. They came back from the honeymoon. And my dad and them at that time, my dad used to play music in bars and stuff. This is before he got saved. And uh, they went out to a bar. And do you know what Joe did again? Joe went up to the bar and ordered a drink. And from that time forward, every single time that they went out to play music, Joe drank. Every single time. He ended up his life, uh, you know, uh, he, he had a, a very lucrative job. He ended up in his life at about 45, 48 years old, going ahead and taking his retirement. His wife had divorced him. He moved into a house and squandered all of his retirement on guess what? Drinking alcohol, on drinking alcohol, on booze, his entire, all of his retirement. He ended up in his life, the electricity was shut off and he's just living in this house by himself, just getting a, a social security check after he had squandered all of his retirement. And you know what he did, what he, what he, what he would do with his social, he obviously wasn't turning the electricity on. Do you know what he spent his social security check on? Alcohol. Alcohol. Do you know what he did? He traded everything for alcohol. Do you know who, who he was really obeying? Do you know who his master was? Alcohol. Now do you think, he, you think he knew that when he sat down at that bar in the hotel to take a, his very first drink? Of course not. He had no idea. He ended up just destroying his entire life. Why? Because he, he became enslaved to the bottle. Alcohol told him when he was going to drink. It completely took over, and that's what his entire life became about. You know, what it, you know where his checks went? He paid it to who? Al, to alcohol. That's who he paid it to. That was his master. That was his boss. That was who was reigning over him. Do you know where his retirement went? Alcohol. He traded his family. He traded everything for alcohol.
Everything that he had, he gave it to alcohol. Do you know why? Because that was his master. That was who reigned over him. That's who he had to give all of his money to. Look at, uh, I want you to look at this as actually, we're warned about this in Proverbs chapter number 23. Proverbs chapter number 23. <clears throat> look at Proverbs chapter number 23. It's the warnings of alcohol and everything that it can do to your life. I want you to begin reading with me. Look at verse 29. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. Now, does that all sound like good things or bad things? Horrible things, right? Now look at verse 35. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. Now, does that person sound like he's, you know, he's observing reality properly? You know what's going on there is he's in denial. Well, do you know what he's doing? He's saying, we be in bondage to no man. Look at what it says next. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. And then he says this. When shall I awake? I will seek it, yet again. So notice, when he awakes, what does he go do? He seeks after the alcohol. Do you know what he goes to? The alcohol. The lures of the flesh. It allures through the flesh. Go to Job chapter... I'll, I'll just read you. Job chapter number 3, verse number 3. It says this, And they have cast lot, lots for my people, and have given... That reference was wrong. And have given a boy for an harlot. Now listen to this. And sold a girl for wine that they might drink. Do you know what they're doing? They're giving their family up for alcohol. They're trading their family in for alcohol. Do you know why? Because alcohol, because this particular sin became their master. You know what they do? They just pay everything to them. They spend their life serving them. They spend their life serving that particular sin or serving that particular problem. Go to... Uh, uh, or temptation. Go to Joshua chapter number 22. Joshua chapter number 22. <clears throat> so point number one was the addiction. That's the first example of the long-term effects of sin because you think, hey, I'm just going to try it for you know, this once. I'm just going to you know, uh, uh, try it one time and receive you know, the temporary tingle and then I'm going to move on in life. But that's not how it works. That particular opportunity that you're being presented with, whether you're ignorant to it or not, is a snare. Whether you're aware of it or not, it's a trap that's being set before you. And you think, yeah, I'm just going to come in one time. But you're not in control. You think you are. You think you're not going to be in bondage to any man. But you're going to come in and you're going to taste of it. Then you're going to be pulled into the trap. And then guess what? The gate closes. And now you're locked in. Now you're in captivity. Uh, so that's point number one. It's addiction. It's a long-term addiction. That's one of the examples of the long-term effects of sin. Point number two is that <clears throat> the long-term of damage of, of sin is this. It goes from generation to generation. There are generational effects. You will pass this sin. Not only will you commit this sin and think it's just going to stop and stay with you, but it's actually going to continue on long term. Oftentimes you're going to pass this sin on to your children. So Joshua chapter number 22. Joshua chapter number 22. I normally have these verses uh, pasted here. Sorry about that. Joshua chapter number 22. I want you to look with me. Uh, verse number 15, it says, And they came unto the children of Reuben, and to the children of Gad, and to the half and to the half tribe of Manasseh, unto the land of Gilead. And they spake with them, saying, Thus saith the whole congregation of the Lord, What trespass is this that ye have committed against the God of Israel, to turn away this day from following the Lord? And that ye have builded you an altar, that ye might rebel this day against the Lord. Now look at verse 17. Is the iniquity of Peor too little for us, from which we are not cleansed, until this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord. I want you to turn to 1 Kings chapter number 12. I want you to notice that there was a sin that had been committed. This is Joshua now. He's taken over after Moses. This is generations later. And there, there was a sin that was committed in the transgression of Peor, the iniquity of Peor. And I want you to notice that they were still not cleansed of that sin, he says, until this day. Do you know what there were? There were long-term effects of that sin. 
sin, that were lingering about in the children of Israel, that were passed from one generation unto the next generation. I want you to look with me at 1 Kings chapter number 12. I get there myself. 1 Kings chapter number 12. <clears throat> 1 Kings chapter number 12. I'll give you another example of where this takes place generation to generation. You think that your sins are only affecting you, but you're wrong. Oftentimes people think, oh, this is just my vice. You know, and I, this is something that I just struggle with. But it's not only affecting you, it's going to affect your children. It's not only going to affect you, it's going to affect the next generation as well. Look at 1 Kings chapter number 12. Once you look with me at verse number 32, this is about Jeroboam. Verse number 32 is the king of Israel. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the seventh day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And it says this, And he offered upon the altar, so did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priest of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart, and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. And he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. Now go to 1 Kings chapter number 22. 1 Kings chapter number 22. Jeroboam was the first king, the very first king of uh, Israel after the split. Rehoboam and, and Israel, or I'm sorry, Jeroboam were both reigning concurrently, one in Judah, one in Israel. And Jeroboam was the very first king after the split. And once they divided, you know, he was afraid that all of the people that were there under his rule in Israel were going to leave and they were going to go to Judah and uh, to seek after the temple, to seek after, you know, the place of the Lord. So what he did was he went ahead and created his own altar. And he went and he actually uh, you know, devised of his own heart calves that he was going to build. And uh, obviously this is idolatry. It's wickedness. And he was bringing everyone there and having them come and sacrifice upon the altar there in Bethel. Well, seven generations went by. Seven generations went by. And uh, it was the point where Ahab and Ahaziah... Uh, were, were uh, uh, alive on the earth in the nation of Israel. Look with me here, and I want you to notice how this is worded. Look at 1 Kings chapter number 22, the end of the book of 1 Kings. Look at verse 50. And Jehoshaphat slept with his father, his fathers, and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. And Jehoram, his son, reigned in his stead. Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in Samaria, the seventeenth year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned two years over Israel. Now watch verse 52. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the way of his father, and in the way of his mother, and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel to sin. I want you to notice that Jehoshaphat... The sins that he committed, one of the sins that he committed, is specifically it says that he walked in the sin of his father. His father, the son of Nabat, who made Israel to sin. Now that was not, you know, his direct father. Just, you know, one tier up. There are seven generations in between Ahaziah and Jehoshaphat. I'm sorry, uh, um, Jeroboam. Jeroboam... That was, uh, was, was alive, was on the earth, ruling as king. Seven generations went by, and then Ahaziah was on the earth. But do you know the sin that, that uh, Ahaziah fell into and Ahaziah was committing? Was the sin that his father, seven generations prior, introduced into the nation of Israel. A lot of times we think that our sin is just going to stop with us when we're put in the grave. That's not the case. Oftentimes what happens is your sin gets passed on to the next generation. A sin that you are committing, something that you struggle with. Uh, um, I don't know if you've ever uh, heard any statistics. I, I pasted one of them for you here. But I don't know if you've ever heard any of the statistics about if someone in the home, you know, the father or the mother struggles with uh, drinking or, or drugs, whatever it may be, what the percentage is that their children will drink. Well, uh, there was one that I looked up. Specifically, that if, if a, a parent in the home is involved in drinking alcohol, it, it, they are, your children, I'm sorry, are two times more likely than you were if your father was not. They would be two times more likely to fall into binge drinking. And that is, that's irrelevant. If you, uh, the article went on to explain that it's irrelevant whether you binge drink or not. 
It's irre irrelevant whether you were drinking multiple times a week. It's just if you, if one person was regularly drinking in the home, if one, if one time a week they're drinking in the home, if one parent drinks in the home, if your children, once your children are born and grown and they become adults, they are two times more likely to binge drink than someone that, is gro that grows up in a home that uh, their parents don't drink alcohol at all. Two times more likely. So, the, you know, the, the man that's binge drinking in his home or maybe just drinking, right, you know, one time a week in his home, you know, the father, he's not thinking about how he's affecting his children. But what he's doing is he's increasing the chances that his children are going to grow up and be a binge drinker. But he thinks that, hey, this is just short term. When I get put into the grave, my sin's just going to die with me. No, it's going to carry on oftentimes the generation, from one generation to the next. My pastor used to always say when I was growing up, he used to always say whatever sin that you struggle with and that you commit openly in your home and your children t uh, witness, they're going to take that sin even further. Now obviously there's, there's exceptions to this, but th this is the risk. And this is the, the majority of the time. By and large, your children will take it further. Uh, a perfect example of sin passing from one generation to the next is Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, of course, sinned. And what did they do? They passed sin down to us many generations later. The third point is the consequences. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter number 11. We're going to end here in Hebrews chapter number 11. But the third point is that the consequences are not short term. They are long term. The, co the consequences are long term. Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 25 says this, speaking of Moses, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, then it says this, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Turn over to Hebrews chapter number 12, just one chapter. So I want you to notice that there are pleasures in sin. You know, a lot of people, a lot of preachers will stand up and they'll misidentify this. They'll, they'll, you know, they'll try to pretend like there aren't pleasures in sin but they only last for a season. Obviously, they're bad pleasures. They're wrong pleasures. You know, if, if uh, sin was not pleasurable in any form, then it would not entice anyone. But they're, they're obviously bad pleasures, pleasures that we should not enjoy. And not only that, they're not permanent. They're vain and they're shallow and they only last for a short time. They only last for a season. And the problem is that there's pleasure in sin for a season, but the consequences of sin last a lifetime. Look at Hebrews chapter number 12. We're warned about this right here in Hebrews chapter number 12. It says in verse 16, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance. And then it says this, though he sought it carefully with tears. This is the bad, this is probably the worst thing about sin, is that the, the consequences are forever. The consequences are for a lifetime. See, you may just think that you're just gonna try, you know, a sin one time, and hey, maybe, and I want this to be the last warning of the morning sermon of these three points, and let this to stick into your mind. Maybe you may only try that particular sin one time. May, maybe you might only, you know, just get into the trap and maybe you get out. There are some times when you go to, you know, Brother Rick did pest control for a long time. And how often do you find, you know, I don't mean to be too gruesome, maybe a leg or something in the, in the trap? Many times? Yeah. Maybe just a body part, you know, uh, in the trap. You know what happened is that it got away, didn't it? Yeah. Maybe it's a rat or whatever it is. It's disgusting. But whatever it is, it got into the trap. And you know what it got? It got what it wanted. It pulled, and the cheese is gone, isn't it, Brother Rick? Yeah. Whatever it is, the peanut butter, whatever it was, it got away with it, didn't it? But it didn't get away unscathed. It might have enjoyed the pleasures of sin for a season. It might have gotten just that temporary tingle or just that momentary, you know, sufficing of, of, you know, the taste of it. But even if, even if, Christian, if you just try it one time, you're not going to get away undamaged. You're not going to get away, you know, just unscathed or untouched. Even if you don't fall into addiction, even if your children never fall into this sin, that doesn't mean that you are not going to have lingering consequences for the rest of your life. Right. There are many examples of people that maybe just committed fornication one time. Just one time in their life, they decided, maybe they're a Christian person, they, they grew up in a good, godly home, and they decided, 
that they were going to go to bed before they were married. And you know what the result ended up being? A child. And then they ended up maybe getting married to you know, the love of their life. But now they have this child for the rest of their life. And obviously they love them. But you know, is that how they would have wanted this to work out in their life? Is that God's ideal example of, of how they want us to grow up? Of how He wants us to live our lives? No. You know what you may do is you may just, just go drinking alcohol one time and get into the car with a friend that does it all the time and he thinks he's going to go out driving. And that could be the end of your life. Right. You know, maybe you don't die. Maybe literally you, you lose a leg like that rat. Maybe something happens, you know, as far as a punishment from God. You know, the consequences of sin last a lifetime. Right. Maybe you look at something that you shouldn't be looking at. Maybe you decide to, to view something that you shouldn't be looking at. Images, images that are put into your mind are never going to leave. Right. Especially, you know, uh, uh, sinful images and sinful, you know, uh, visions. Right. Those things, you know, I'm sure everyone in here can testify to the fact of just, just, just uh, things that you've seen in your mind that you wish that you would have never looked at. Right. You wish that you would have never viewed. And you just can't get it out of your head, can you? You wish you would have never looked at it. You wish you would have never been there. And it's just stuck in your mind. You know, there was a, a, an evangelist that used to come around to our church all the time that lived a, a really sinful, wicked life. He was actually like the vice president of the Outlaws, uh, which was, is a huge bike, biker gang. He was the vice president, like a chapter, a, a, a leader and region. Uh, his name is Dave Spurgeon. He used to come around and he used to talk about how when he goes to pray, when he sits down and we close our eyes to pray and they're opening in prayer, how so often he just has them so deeply embedded in his mind, just horrible images will just pop up into his mind randomly. Just horrible things. When he's just sitting down, he just wants to talk to the Lord and pray to God. He'll just have these horrible visions and images that just pop into his mind. Maybe a word that somebody says triggers it. Maybe, you know, a, a smell triggers it or a thought, a chain of thoughts triggers it. Those images will never leave his mind. So you may think, hey, I'm just going to try this one time. But just like Esau, he thought, hey, I'm, I'm just, I'm starving right now. I'm hungry right now. You know, and you know what he was willing to do? He was willing to trade his birthright. He was willing to trade his birthright for what, as, as many people have said, and it's, and it's true, for just a bowl of chili. Think about that. Just a stinking bowl of chili. Just one time sitting down and enjoying one bowl of chili. You know what he did? He traded his birthright forever. And there's so many things that he missed out on in that birthright when you stop and think about it. When you open up to Matthew chapter number 1 and you're reading about the generations of Jesus Christ, you know what it would have said? Abraham begat Isaac and Isaac begat Esau and Esau begat so and so. He, he, he would have been, he would have had the, the responsibility of, of bringing the Messiah into the world. He would have had God's favorite nation named after him. It would have been Esau. You know what he lost? He lost that forever. You know, and when we get to heaven, there are the gates. And you know who the gates are named after? The 12 tribes of Israel, which is Jacob. Do you know who they would have been named after? The 12 tribes of Esau. And do you know what he traded that for? A bowl of chili. That's what he traded that for. He thought, oh, I'm hungry. I'm starving. It's something that I must have right now. And it'll just be over. You know what he thought about was the now. He thought about the temporary. But you know what he forgot about was the long-term effects of sin. He may not have continued down that same road. And when we read about Esau, it seems like he straightened up his life in a lot of ways. He's there with his father. Seems like he did. He lived maybe a good godly life. There's nothing else spoken badly about him. But he made one bad decision and it haunted him for the rest of his life. There were permanent effects of that. There were permanent consequences that will never, that will never go away. And that he could never change. There are many people that chose to live a life of sin and maybe they got away. Maybe they snuck out of that trap. Maybe they got out of that snare. But they're still missing a leg. They have a big scar from it. They're missing a body part. They have, they have, there were major consequences. There were major consequences to that sin that they had committed. And, and you know, this is, this is where it has... This is, you know, I, I believe the best warning. 
then this is where it has to begin for the person that's, that's never even tasted of it. What you need to understand is that there are pleasures in sin for a season. It's temporary. It may taste good the one time, but even if, my friend, even if you only try it the one time, the consequences are for a lifetime. There's pleasures in sin for a season, but the consequences are for a lifetime. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you so much for the Hank family stopping by and being a blessing unto us, dear Lord. Uh, we thank you, dear Lord, for the, all the, the examples in the Bible, the good and the bad. Uh, Esau is a bad example and everything that we can lose out on and how uh, uh, spontaneous decisions where we're just focusing on the now or just focusing on the temporary can, can uh, bring consequences and a curse for a lifetime. We ask you, dear Lord, that you'd guide us with, our, with your spirit. Help us to not uh, to be alert by the lust of the flesh into the snares and the traps, dear God, but help us to walk in your word and to walk in the light thereof, dear God, and to, uh, to be able to uh, uh, continue in the spirit and not to be a servant to the flesh. We ask you, you'd bless our church and, and keep our visitors safe, dear Lord, as they travel. We love you so much, and in Jesus Christ's name, amen.